Hey everyone, welcome to our small footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off grid in Australia. Now, we're sort of coming back onto regularly scheduled videos, kind of uh, back to food prep uh, from the six weekly grocery haul and the food hamper. So our food hamper that we receive is a food bank, food pantry, food hamper style uh, item and we pay $50 for it and get whatever we're given. This this month we got a whole lot of Queen Garnet plums and some apples that needed to be processed. Uh, I ended up with some extra plums because I said give me a bell if there's some spare at the end of the day and Daryl went back and grabbed some more so we ended up with a whole bunch of plums to process which is fantastic because we can make plenty of things out of it so I had to start that pretty much straight away though because there were so many and we didn't have the second fridge or anywhere to store it we actually still have a couple of boxes that I have to go through today to make sure that I pull any that need to go to the animals out and do something with the rest of them so one of the things we really like with plums is plum barbecue sauce it's similar to the apple barbecue sauce in that it's a fruit based uh, sauce. Different ingredients though, but super tasty. Uh, and we have made it before. Last year when plums were in season, we made it last year. So I thought that would be a good way to use up a whole bulk of them at a time. Uh, so that's what we did today. We also did some plum tart. So that's what I'm covering in today's video. But we do have plenty of other things that I did with it that I'll follow on with. Uh, I used my steam juicer to juice some of them made apple plum cordial uh, and we made uh, Worcestershire sauce with the plums as well and things like that so today is plum barbecue sauce uh, I don't have the ratios written down in my notes but I'll put it in the comments below and I actually made a triple batch of this later on as well in the bigger pot so uh, we now have an abundance of plum barbecue sauce on the shelves though realistically for our size family we go through sauce pretty quick so come along and see what how I did the plum barbecue and I'll share the recipe and uh, I'll see you at the end Alrighty, so even for us, we had too many plums for just fresh eating. So we made a whole bunch of different treats with it. In the what we in a week video, you saw a plum crumble that has been requested a couple of times. Everyone really liked that, uh, and it's super easy to make. And I also was doing pastry in the what we eat week video. I think it was there too that I did the uh, cocktail franks covered in pastry. So I had extra pastry out at the time, and I did some little plum pastries. Uh, I did these last year when nectarines were in season as well. We used it with those. They're really nice, and it basically it's just you cut your pieces of pastry into the size or shape that you want, and then you make a score line just in from that shape. So there's a, a perimeter all the way around. In the middle there you put something dry we used some cashew butter this time because that's what i had on hand and then you put your fruit and then you egg wash the outside bit that you've scored and put a little sprinkle of sugar and by doing that when you bake them the outside edge puffs up a little bit like a tart shell and the inside is your fruit tart it's really lovely really simple to do now i had the oven a bit high for the sausages which I mentioned in that one, obviously were a bit high for these tarts as well. So they haven't puffed as nicely because the temperature hit them a little too hard. It needed to be increased a little slower. But when they get perfect, they have the really the sides really puff up. And you can put an extra layer on there as well. Like you can put a bit of uh, butter and then put another layer of pastry in that external rim. And it puffs up even more, a bit like a, I'm going to say a volivant. I don't know if that's how it's said. But those little volivant pastry cases that you can buy similar sort of a concept it's just a little bit more fiddly and I was going for simple so something a little bit dry sprinkled on the bottom almond meal works we used cashew butter because that's what I had and the fruit and that's all you need to do is stick it in the oven and you end up having these little tartlet things uh, I had the sweetened cashew cream from when we made the plum crumble so I did a little drizzle of that over the top aesthetics but also tastes good and we had them as a snack when we had the sausages wrapped in pastry as well uh, I definitely need to make the plum crumble a few more times and I have some jars of stewed plums on the shelf that would be perfect for that too that I hadn't used for that purpose before so I'll have to do that as well after we did that we got started on the first big batch of plums so I really need some larger pots this is a 14 litre pot and it's a bit small for the batch that I'm doing keep that in mind if you decide to make the same size batch but I really like this brand of pot. They're a soga pot and they're really wide. They're not a narrow stock pot. They're sort of more of a, a stew pot or a casserole pot. And they have uh, a heavy bottom base and a wide 
diameter to them which works really well when you're cooking over gas because if it's too narrow things burn on the bottom and don't heat through at the top so you need that wide heavy bottom base for doing this sort of thing cast iron works really well but not for certain things like making this sort of sauce and stuff you could get enameled cast iron but they're very heavy and they're expensive so anyway uh these they do a 23 liter and a 32 liter of this pot so i might end up having to grab one of each of those maybe two of the 23 liters i think the 23 liter would be a better size for me than this 14 liter one this one's great for cooking pasta and stuff and it's the right size for cooking a kilo of pasta in but anyway sidetracked uh so the pot was a little bit small but we managed uh, i filled the pot with halved and pitted plums i used six kilos in this batch so i just sliced them in half so i find it easy just to run a knife around the middle of the plum twist them off and then use a stainless steel uh, measuring spoon to take the pit out i put the pits aside to use for something else because there's flesh still stuck on them and then i put the halved plums in the pot these were already washed and I make sure to cut any bits off them if there's any bits that need cutting off them of course too. Uh, I sliced up some onion and some garlic. It doesn't need to be overly fine because I'm going to immersion blend this sauce later on so it's irrelevant on the shape of it other than the fact that it's going to cook down quicker if it's smaller. So I cut up some onion and some garlic to put in with it as well. I added some ground ginger. I have a jar in the fridge that I'm using at the moment. I actually found a couple of bags of frozen ginger in the freezer that I didn't realize I had from one of my last harvests and uh i but it has a skin on because i generally use it for things like my ginger beer bug or uh for uh, making cordial or the tea for the ginger beer and things like that and the skin doesn't matter on it so it's all diced up but with skin on so it wouldn't have been suitable for this anyway but maybe next time i have to remember to, to peel some before freezing it because then i could use it for this sort of thing but i have a big jar from an asian store or an indian store or something that i had in my fridge anyway so i used that uh, I also added apple cider vinegar, some mustard powder. I don't have any made up mustard at the moment, so I just use some mustard powder uh, and some salt. I mixed it all up to distribute the onion under the surface of the the plum so that as the plums release the liquid that would have the stewing factor for the onions and garlic and stuff as well. Uh, I looked up the this recipe last year when I was making it, and I've got a whole bunch of notes in my notepad from last year when I made it, so that's what I was using to make this lot. Uh, the I added sugar, but the recipes, the ratio of sugar in most of these recipes was far higher than I was comfortable using, which is pretty common for me in most of these sauces. I think the thing is that we just eat a, like as much as I use a lot of sugar when I'm preserving and I've gone through like 12 or 15 kilos of sugar in the last week, uh, it's made, it's spread out across a lot of product. So when I uh, make an individual product, I, I don't want to use the amount of sugar that's there because we're not used to eating things that sweet. And we, so therefore we don't need to. If you're used to buying barbecue sauce and tomato sauce from a shop and you're used to that flavor, then this is probably going to be not very sweet. It might be an issue for you. But for us, we're pretty used to the lower sugar quantities. So I always reduce the sugar. So I looked at all my notes that I had from previous and made a an educated guess from my last batch that I made and things like that. So the average across the recipes for this six kilo of plums was about 11 cups of sugar, which is huge. Like a cup of sugar is around about 200 grams, 200, 220 grams. So you're, you're looking at like two and a half kilos at, or at least of that. It's a lot of sugar anyway. So I started with four cups, which is about 800 grams of sugar. Uh, about so about a third of the amount of sugar that the recipe is called for I generally find a third to a half depending on what I'm making is about how much sugar I will use based compared to other recipes uh, so I added that sugar I seem to have missed filming it but I also added some molasses because I used raw sugar and I like the taste of the brown sugar uh, and I added a little bit of Worcestershire sauce because again I just like the flavor as well as a couple of drops of liquid smoke now none of those are compulsory for the flavor of the sauce but that's how we like it that smoky depth of flavor that the Worcestershire the molasses and the smoke liquid smoke adds and then just let it go so I brought it up to a boil so it was bubbling heavily and then down to a low simmer. I did have an issue with it. I walked away to help. Someone called me and it came up to a boil while I walked away and it did overflow a little bit, left a bit of a sticky mess that had to be cleaned up. But uh, again, I, this pot was a bit small for what I was doing, but I don't really have another pot that's an in-between size. There's this or my canning pot, which is 30 litres. So I was kind of stuck with 
what I had. Uh, so take it up to a boil, but then turn it down to a simmer anyway. So uh, once it was simmering, it wasn't too bad. I immersion blended it then because uh, that was going to reduce the, the levels in there as well if I immersion blended it. So I immersion blended it to reduce the levels in the pot uh, and then kept on simmering it. So you want to simmer it to it until it's at the consistency that you want. Uh, that is variable depending on what you're using it for uh, because this isn't overly sweet it could be used as a marinade like a barbecue marinade like a put on pork ribs or roasts and things like that or get thicker and it's a pouring sauce for dipping stuff in or whatever you want so I cook it down I don't generally take it down about a third uh, I'm not overly concerned about it being too thick because we use it in a myriad of ways and the kids don't really care. Uh, so I generally take it down about a third. The, it takes a fair bit of gas in time to, to reduce these sources and things like that. And there's always a risk of burning the bottom the longer it's sitting there, especially if I walk away for any reason. So generally speaking, I reduce it about a third. But that is personal preference for, you, for anyone who wants to make it, depending on what they like, how they like their sauce. Uh, while I was waiting for the for it all to happen and other things I was doing I did some plum vinegar now I added all the pits that I pulled out and a couple of extra plum pieces and things like that into a jar and put a tablespoon of sugar and filled it up with filtered water put a cover a breathable cloth cover over it and this will sit with the fruit in it for a few weeks and then eventually the fruit will come out and it'll sit capped off uh, in the dark cupboard for uh, quite a while after that as well and we'll have plum vinegar now to be honest, uh, you know, being truthful here, a lot of this stuff doesn't work for me. Uh, they, we live in such a dusty, non-sterile environment that it's really hard for me to get jars completely sterile, which is why I process everything. I don't put anything in jars and keep it in jars. I process everything. So even things that you can uh, theoretically cap off in a jar, like a lot of these cordials, if you've got the citric acid and tartaric acid and stuff, you can just cap them off and keep them uh, for a few months on a shelf. That's the theory anyway. I don't do any of that because as much as my kitchen is cleaned every day and everything's wiped down with, you know, disinfectants or, or citrus vinegars or whatever else, I don't live in a clean environment so uh, I have a lot of problems with things like these scrap vinegars and stuff and growing yeast so this one actually has a layer of calm yeast in it at the moment cam calm however it's pronounced k-a-h-m yeast uh, which is edible it's not going to hurt you but can cause flavor issues and doesn't look real great so we will see how this one goes I'll show it to you later on but uh, as a disclaimer we have a lot of problems with these sorts of things. But theoretically, you should be able to put cloth over it, put it somewhere out of the way, and leave it for, I think it's four to eight weeks with the fruit in it, and then the same again once the fruit comes out, and you end up with a flavoured vinegar. So I'm going to give it a go, because I like the idea of plum vinegar, because I reckon it will be a really pretty colour. But anyway, I'm not wasting anything, because I'm using scraps, so the only thing I'm wasting is my own time, realistically. So, you know. I kept an eye on the sauce the whole time it was doing, coming in and out, and made sure to scrape the bottom as required and blending it if I found any lumps. Now, I do immersion blend it, and I do it a couple of times, but I'm using a really cheap immersion blender because my expensive one broke and I haven't had the opportunity to replace it, and this one works. Uh, it's corded, which is a pain in the ass, but other than that, it, it works. But it doesn't work fantastically. Now, I could have transferred the sauce into the Thermomix and... Uh, pureed it there which would have made it smoother but that was a lot of extra dishes and everything else and it's a sauce we don't really need it completely thin it, it's we're not fussy so I kept on immersion blending it but it was a little textured there is a little bit of fruit texture to it if you don't like that you're going to need to strain it or you're going to need to puree it better than I did uh, but if you immersion blend it or blend it in any way, you need to make sure that you simmer it for a minimum of five minutes post doing that because otherwise you're going to have air in your jars. So by immersion blending it or blending it in a blender, you're introducing air into the sauce. And if you put that straight into your jars, you can end up with froth um, and incorrect head spacing and things like that because of the air in the jars. So just make sure that you low simmer it for at least five minutes post blending it just to make sure that you cook that air back out of it. Once it was how I wanted it, uh, it had rested it, 
and everything else, it was time to can it up. So I used Fowler's 27s. This is what I used for the apple butter barbecue, and it seems to be working well. My theory with them is that they're wide enough that I can get a spatula in there, so I'm not wasting any sauce. Uh, I really like using like Posada bottles and things like that for uh, sauces, but the problem is, is that you can't get them empty very well unless you leave them upside down, and they're glass, and that's an issue. So by using these 27s, what I do is I scrape them straight into squeeze bottles. So we open one up and we pour it into a squeeze bottle with a funnel, scrape it out and do it that way. That way the kids aren't handling the glass jars constantly in and out of the fridge uh, and the uh, less wastage because they're not using spoons, they're not contaminating the sauce by sticking a spoon in the sauce and all that sort of thing. So that's what I found has worked. I have considered getting the food grade pumps that you can get for the mason jars. I have some food grade pumps, but they're on tall bottles that I use for our sugar syrup for our iced coffee. But you can buy ones that fit mason jars. Uh, the mason jar lifestyle or something like that. It's an American site sells them for not a bad price. Uh, shipping is a flat rate. So when I order from there, I keep on hesitating because I want to order a decent amount because the shipping's flat rate. So I haven't done it yet. But if I do, I'll make sure to show it with you. But that way I could potentially can in the mason jars and you just have a screw on uh, pump lid that just goes on them when you open a jar which would be kind of nice though again it is a glass jar my kids are fairly good with glass but there's been some significant breakages lately which is driving me a bit nuts but anyway okay so I got seven jars of sauce out of this six kilo batch of plums so it's not a huge batch for the amount of work that is required especially with the cooking down and everything else so I did actually make a three time batch as well a few days later and I will I do have footage for that so I'll share that in one of the future videos because I did it in the big canning pot uh, so standard canning procedures for me, cleaned the rims really well with uh, white vinegar on a clean cloth, made sure that there's no sticky residue on the on the rims from the sauce because I'm a bit of a messy jar filler. Put the rubber rings on and clean them with white vinegar as well. I like to wipe my rings down with vinegar because I'm handling them to put them on the jars, grease from your hands, any sort of sauce, anything like that. Uh, and then I wipe the inside of the stainless steel lids with a bit of white vinegar as well. I'm not using excessive amounts here because there is a bit of a concern that the vinegar can be an issue on the rubber rings, but I've never had it be a problem. So I don't know, but I think that it's better to do that than to risk the jar not sealing because I've had a bit of sauce on my hand and then I've handled the jars again, but that's personal choice. Lids go on and then clips. Now, I always put a disclaimer here, Fowler's only recommends a single clip on their jars. I use two clips because my lids are all my clips are all second hand there is some varied sizes in them and they're stretched I find if I use a single clip then quite often I have lids that go skewed and they will not seal so I tend to use two if I have the quantity available to do it that's my choice Fowler's only says a single clip I used my big Buffalo pressure canner as a steam canner. I'm really loving the ability to do this because I have a steam canner, but the Posada jars and the 27s are too tall for the steam canner. So by being able to use the Buffalo for that, it means that I'm still only using four quarts of water in the bottom of the Buffalo instead of having to fill the canner up above the jars. But it gives me all that space to use. And it means I've got the two pressure canners that can be used as steam canners as well. So I did the the normal method for steam canning in a pressure canner four quarts of water in the bottom this is a 30 liter canner so four quarts was fine it was only going up like a third of the jars if you've got a smaller canner you might need less water because you don't want them going the water going up to the rims of the jars but you want enough water in there to process it so the theory with these from what i've seen everywhere is that the four ish quarts of water is the is for a maximum of 40 minutes of processing time because you're going to be losing liquid the whole time you're processing because you're letting the vent the steam vent the whole time so these i put four quarts of water in it put the jars in lid on burner on you want to wait till there's a full stream of steam and then the little pressure valve pops up on the buffalo it's red on the presto it's silver i don't know what color it is on an all-american i've never seen one in person you get the the pressure valve pops up and then you start your timer these jars are over a pint size and I'm over a thousand feet, so I process them for 20 minutes. Uh, they're at with the full stream of steam with the pressure valve up at all times. 20 minutes in that whole process. Uh, I'm also a little over generous with headspace just to point that out because I find these jars at because they narrow at the neck they have a tendency to siphon on me uh, but I have found that with this steam canning process rather than water bath canning I've had a whole lot less issues with any of that so I may try filling them up a little bit more because the headspace is more than it should be uh, 
it looks even more than it should be because the neck's narrower. It probably isn't exceptionally more than it should be, uh, but it is a larger headspace than it's supposed to be. You're only supposed to have a half inch headspace or 15 mil headspace for metric or whatever it is. Uh, and this is definitely more than that, but at the same time, the jar narrows. So that's going to change the volume quantity in that neck. But I have had a lot of siphoning problems if I fill it above that shoulder when pressure canning or water bath canning, but the steam canning seems to have alleviated that. So I'm going to give it a go. Uh, I also don't keep my jar, like these seven jars are going to be gone in like two months, three months. So it's not like I've got the longevity of storage required either, which the headspace can cause issues within a longevity. So if your headspace is incorrect, you're supposed to use those jars first. Like if one looks like it's siphoned a fair bit, use that jar before you use others, which is fine. Uh, and we use these jars pretty quickly. Nothing sits on my shelf for very long. Most of my canning only sits for six to 12 months. Uh, most of it. There is the occasional thing that lasts for longer than that. Some of my jams and some of the fruit purees and things like that. But generally speaking, it's a pretty short period of time. So once the time is up, you let the pressure valve drop back down. Once the pressure valve drops back down, I crack the lid and like to leave it for five or ten minutes just to let some of the steam dissipate. And then put the jars on a wooden board or a cloth or something, not directly on my stainless steel bench, for to sit undisturbed for 24 hours. So you check the seals in the morning, take the clips off, check the seals, wipe the bottles down, label them and get them ready for the shelf. So that was my plum barbecue sauce. I'll put the ratios in the comments for you, uh, in the description of what I did for that size batch, the six kilo of plum batch, and then you can feel free to adjust it as you want. And I did make a triple batch a couple of days later and it worked quite well. So uh, I worked out weights and stuff for the onions, I think, when I was doing it. So I will put my notes together and I will get that for you as well. So we've got a couple more videos. I got the Worcestershire sauce and the apple plum cordial. I made a lemon ginger cordial and a few other things. So they're all coming in the next couple of videos. I just have to get the time to do these voiceovers because it's just a little bit time consuming to come out here and talk for half an hour, but then it takes me over that to go in and edit it as well. Uh, and then it all has to upload and everything else. So it's time consuming, but uh, things have been a little tight time-wise the last few days. Not that I'm complaining. I'm very grateful for having the audience, very grateful for everyone who watches. Alrighty, I am going to head in and have some breakfast and I will see you guys on the next video. Thanks for watching, guys.